I'm going to ask Uncle Greg to um, start us off with a prayer. And then we'll get started. It is on your ballpark. <laughs> Great Spirit, I want to thank you for another day of life. I want to ask in a special way that you be with any family members of our group who have crossed over and are dealing with that issue of separation because of illness and death. I want to thank you for allowing us as a group to come together and share of what is important to us and to our people. I'm looking forward to your blessings on a daily basis. I hope you talk with. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I wanted to show everybody, in case you didn't know, this is our um, YouTube channel, the II Americas, and that's actually the easiest way to look it up, videos that we produced ourselves, uh, as well as uh, we have playlists of uh, music and videos done by other people that we think are good quality and accurate. And so I also have a playlist of the don't do not use uh, <laughs> videos. So if you happen to have anything you want to contribute, a link to something you especially love or um, something that you are very unhappy about, we can put them into those categories so that this can be a go to place for people, um, for children, you know, to get information as well as adults, because we have both kinds of lists on there. But I didn't know if you all were aware that we had a YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, 332 subscribers, and which is really actually pretty nice for a educational, a little educational list, especially our Ask Uncle Gregory videos. Um, those are pretty popular. And if you're not familiar with the Ask Uncle Gregory series, we uh, have uh, over time repeatedly been asked questions about our culture and our usual answer is, gosh, we need to ask Uncle Gregory about that. And so ultimately it ended up almost like a franchise of videos <laughs> where Greg answers pretty um, uh, truthfully and directly the questions that are asked of us from people outside the culture as well as some difficult ones within the culture. So I'm really excited to introduce today, I'm going to um, stop my screen share here. Uh, we we thought of this idea of talking about Alcatraz when our volunteer Amelia Gaston said, I'm going to California. <laughs> I'm going to go see Alcatraz. <laughs> we're like, wouldn't that be cool if we had our elders who were there at one time in history um, getting a chance to interact with Amelia from the perspective of her going and, and um, uh, her view of it from today. And so we're going to start with Amelia and let her share her thoughts uh, and how she got to, on that journey and tell us a little bit about yourself and because uh, you're doing a lot of wonderful things in the community. And the same for Glennis and uh, Gregory, if you guys could kind of introduce uh, yourselves a little bit too. So Amelia, I'm going to hand the floor over to you and let me know if you have any trouble screen sharing. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I'm Amelia. Um, I've been volunteering with IIA for years now. <laughs> I don't know how many, maybe about eight years. Um, so there's that. Um, but other than that, I'm a graduate student. I'm working on a doctorate degree in sociology. Um, at the University of North Texas, and I'm currently working on my dissertation. Uncle Gregory, thank you. <laughs> it is a struggle. Um, but my dissertation topic, um, I'm actually working directly with our, our school's uh, Native American Student Association. 
So it's kind of a topic that I did not enter grad school thinking I would write a dissertation on, but sometimes problems find you and they make for a good reason to study something. So um, my, my topic kind of looks at the different experiences that Native students at UNT have, um, how they navigate their identities, um, how some of them um, function within a student org space, and then the intersections of uh, how the school does or does not support them um, culturally or um, as a marginalized group of students. So kind of my explanation of my dissertation changes every day because I'm in the analysis phase of the data. So honestly, if you ask me tomorrow, I might say something different, but um, I'm working with different theories like critical race theory um, and tribal critical race theory. And um, another one that's becoming pretty relevant is um, racial capitalism. So that kind of looks at how, especially predominantly white um, higher education institutions um, capitalize off of the promise of diversity, but may not necessarily pull their weight in what they actually offer to students that are not white. So um, UNT is kind of a really starting to look as though it is a good example of that, although UNT is not predominantly white. So there's kind of some interesting institutional characteristics going on. But anyway, long story long, uh, <laughs> that's what is consuming a lot of my time right now. But um, in terms of Alcatraz, um, I actually took this trip the weekend after Santa Fe Days this year. So I was probably on it. I'm not going to lie. I um, After Santa Fe Days, you know, the physical recovery is a lot. And so I spent a week like soaking in the bathtub, going to the chiropractor, stretching, buying new shoes, um, <laughs> because San Francisco requires a lot of walking. And uh, I was concerned that my body wouldn't hold up from having done Santa Fe days one weekend and then walking the hills of San Francisco the following weekend. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so this was in April. Um, I've visited San Francisco previously, but was not able to go to Alcatraz. So this is my first time going. Um, and, you know, Alcatraz was not like the focus of the whole trip, but it was definitely something that like was a requirement to go do this time. So I booked the reservation in advance. Um, if anyone on this call has never been, definitely book in advance the likelihood of you showing up to San Francisco and then actually being able to get a ticket while you're there is really low. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how many people that they see every day, but it's in the thousands every day. So, um, I'll just start a little bit with like the logistics of getting to Alcatraz because I think it's relevant. Um, so if you haven't been to San Francisco before, um, it's honestly like a lot different from DFW, obviously, but it's about a seven by seven square mile city. So a lot of it is walkable if you are able to walk. Um, however, a lot of the walking is straight up and straight down <laughs> in terms of the hills. So, um, it's nice in terms of it has a lot of different neighborhoods you can go to, but where, what you have to do to get to Alcatraz is go to the area called Fisherman's Wharf, and that's right on the coast um, of the bay. So from there, you can see things like the Golden Gate Bridge, um, and you can see Alcatraz from that bay area, but you basically purchase your ticket online through the National Park Service. Um, they have their own contracted company, so be sure you're not purchasing from a third party. Um, and then you you go to the pier, so maybe take an Uber or a Lyft or get a ride to the pier, show up about 30 minutes early before your tour time, you wait in a little line, and then you hop on a ferry boat. So <laughs> I'm going to share my screen now. This is a video of... Um, 
actually when we were leaving, but it, it gives you an idea of what it looks like to kind of roll up to the island. You hop on a ferry. Uh, the ferry ride is probably about 10 minutes, so it's really short. I would say if you're ever planning on going to Alcatraz or San Francisco in general, pack for any weather because you will be hot and cold within a span of an hour. San Francisco is, is really awesome in terms of the weather and the climate. However, it has a lot of microclimates. So San Francisco is very unique in that it has microclimates that, you know, one square mile over may be experiencing completely different weather from you, which I found that to be pretty relevant. I'll tell you why a little bit later. But this day was a nice sunny day. My friend and I went the tickets were around, I want to say about $50 each, so 100 total for us. We went a little bit after lunch. I think we went about one o'clock. I wore layers. Um, a t-shirt was pretty much fine, but there were moments where you wanted to have a jacket on. Um, so just layer up. Um, and here's what it looks like, kind of the view of the rock. I don't know if you could see all those birds flying around, <laughs> um, but one thing that's pretty significant about Alcatraz is that it's a bird sanctuary. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's just kind of an idea of what it looks like to cruise up to Alcatraz or kind of go away from the island. Um, it really is a rock. Like it when you get on the island you do you do understand that okay you know if you're trying to house prisoners that pretty much had no chance of escaping this is a very good location for that because it's in the middle of the pacific ocean um the water is very choppy it's very cold um it looks beautiful on a day like this but i could imagine how daunting it would be to consider having to swim in that water ever I, I wanted to go over quickly um, just a little bit of history of Alcatraz in terms of how it got its name. And Uncle Gregory probably knows all of this, but um, the original name was, was given to it by Spanish colonizers. So the Alcatraz name came from the original name that was given when the first um, Spanish explorer, I guess, uh, sailed around that area to make maps. So from the first maps that were made of that area, that's where the name came from. The information that was shared in the exhibits indicated that there is no archeological evidence that any people ever inhabited the island um, on a permanent basis or had any kind of um, settlements there, but there's evidence that it was used um, just as a pass through. So for folks who were passing through those canals. Um, there's evidence that people set foot on the island, but not that there were any permanent living settlements there of any um, tribes. So I think probably what was really significant for me immediately was that um, when you're on the ferry boat and you're going up to the island, like I showed you in that video, um, and you park, they park the boat and they dock it. I happen to be facing away from the island, just looking at the scenery. <laughs> and I turned around and the first thing I saw was this. And that's where they park you. So you, you come off of the ferry boat and this is where you enter. So I could imagine for folks that don't know the um, <clears throat> history of the occupation that they probably would not know what to make of that. Um, if you're the per kind of person that only knows Alcatraz as a prison. So um, that was very, and I, I'll probably get emotional right now, but like pulling up to that was very emotional for me. Um, so yeah, it's just hard to put into words like. Are these your photos too, Amelia? Yeah, yeah. So all this, all these will be my photos, but just to see that the paint was fresh. Sorry, trying to hold it together. <laughs> um, but yeah, they 
they have um, descendants of the occupiers come and repaint. So all of the paint is maintained by native people. Um, so this is in itself a historical marker. Um, sorry, trying to get mentally back there. It's hard though. I mean, my experience at Alcatraz was very emotional. So <laughs> excuse me if I'm making this long-winded, but um, it was. Emilia. Yeah. Don't be, just express who you are, express your feelings. That's critically important, not only for you, but for the rest of us and anybody else who may see this later on. Yeah, okay. I'm trying. It's just hard to talk when you're like about to cry. <laughs> if here come, then let us let us see them and enjoy them. Um. So yeah, I had I especially in this just the very beginning of, um, arriving on the island was very emotional. Um. It was a visceral experience in my body, um, just seeing that. So anyway, um, this is where the tour starts. So this actually here is the National Parks office. So so actually where you end if you go on like a full walking exploration. So in here is actually the gift shop, <laughs> um, right behind this huge sign, but yeah. Um, so when you arrive, you huddle up in this area outside of this giant welcome sign. Um, and the park ranger gives you the lowdown of what the rules are, what to do, what not to do, um, and just kind of the rundown of everything on the island where everything is. And the, the cool thing is you can go at your own pace. So you kind of show up and you can just walk around wherever you want to go. So you don't have to go in any particular order. You don't have to follow a tour, but you can. They have a walking tour if you're interested in that. They have a few actually going on at the same time. Um, but I think one of the biggest comical things about the, the talking to by the park ranger was don't look up and don't open your mouth while you look up. Because remember I said it's a bird sanctuary? Um, there are multiple species of seabirds that inhabit the island in the thousands. And so um, you can imagine why they would say don't look up and definitely don't have your mouth open while you look up. <laughs> and um, got to say, I did get hit. So <laughs> I got hit while we were waiting to get on the ferry to go back. Um, and the park ranger saw it and she called me out on the megaphone. So that was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, there's birds everywhere. So down on this ground level, you're not allowed to eat. Um, they, or they ask you to, or sorry, that's the opposite. You're allowed to eat at the ground level, but any levels above that, they ask that you don't eat because you will get swarmed by birds. So um, moving on. Um, there, the explanation explanation of this comes kind of in a different area of the island. So like I said, to pull up and see this sign, I would imagine, especially for folks that are not familiar with this history, would be like, well, what's that all about? Um, and it's not explained right there. You have to go do the tour of the island to find out. Um, and so we were told that there was a red power exhibit um, that was all about the indigenous history and the occupation. So when we started our walking, we went in that direction. So here's what it looks like to kind of walk up the, this is actually a driveway. So if you think of, um, you know, army vehicles, federal vehicles, all of these are roadways. So, you know, again, Alcatraz is its own island. So it had its own fully functioning, um, I hate to say, but prison economy there. Um, and the, the origins of Alcatraz, there's a lot of history, but if, if we're talking about like the political origins, 
Um, firstly, it was used as a defense fort. So because San Francisco at one point had become such a, um, a big area for commerce and they were trying to make it even more of a port of commerce, they had to defend it. So Alcatraz was a defense fort and it was mounted with these giant cannons all around the island. Um, but they actually never used them. So Alcatraz never defended anything, but it was set up to be a, a fort of defense. <laughs> um, and then um, later in history, um, and I'll, I'll get to that when I get to the photos, but um, there's history of uh, the Hopi prisoners um, 19 prisoners that were forcibly arrested and taken to Alcatraz. And the short story is that essentially these were folks who the government was unable to steal their children to take them to boarding school. And these were people, especially men that put up a fight. And so they were arrested to be made an example of, um, they thought that if they could arrest these Hopi men that um, they would teach them while they were on the island about all of the great things about education and convince them to allow their children to go to boarding school. But we all know how that went. So um, there, I'll show this as well. There's a page um, that gives a really detailed history on that and it's managed by the National Park Service, but it's it's really accurate and it, it names all of the Hopi men and it goes into really, really good detail down to like month by month, you know, how they came to, to that point of being prisoners on Alcatraz. Um, oops, whoa, sorry everyone. Okay, um, so as we got to walking, one of the first things you notice is the greenery. Um, not something I, I didn't go into it expecting anything, but I didn't expect for Alcatraz to be like a botanical garden. And it was. <laughs> um, and I found out, and you'll see in some of the other photos, I found out that um, the reason there's so many, so much biodiversity of plant species there is because at one point when it was, um, I might be messing this up, either an army fort or when Alcatraz was a prison, early, in the early days of it being a prison, um, the guards' families actually lived on the island. And so the women actually started these gardens. So these gardens are over a hundred years old. Um, and you would not believe the amount of succulents, like specifically succulents. And I've never seen them this big and I've never seen them in this quantity and I've never seen the species that I saw that day. So that was just really surprising to me. But so you kind of continue up on this little path here, uh, walking up to where the exhibit was. Um, this is one of the first um, informational pieces. And this is just what they have on hand that talks about the, um, sorry, about the occupation, or not the occupation, the Hopi prisoners. So um, I will say that they did a really good job at putting these facts in your face. Um, like I said, especially for folks that may not know the indigenous history. Um, so like I said, we started at the building that was housing this red power exhibit. And I believe, I wish that I could remember what this building served as, um, but I know that this building here was like a factory and it's wild. I have a picture of it from the other side I'll show in a minute that shows all of the growth from within that building. So here's a, a nice sign that they had that explained what I mentioned earlier about there not being evidence of folks um, inhabiting the island on any permanent basis or semi-permanent basis, but um, the Olone people were canoe people, uh, water people, so they definitely inhabited the canals. Um, and, you know, San Francisco and, and surrounding areas at one point were Spanish missions. So there's history of that there as well. 
Um, so it's cool that they have this exhibit set up in a building where um, I want to say you start by reading all about the prison and you kind of get closer and closer. Stuff starts getting redder and redder. <laughs> the materials that they have out. Um, and I just felt like I was just kind of, I don't know. Um, taking it in was a lot. Like this, this exhibit was a lot, but in general, <laughs> there was a lot of feelings going on. Um, but especially, you know, during this exhibit. So I just thought it was cool to see um, folks from all walks of life. And this is supposed to commemorate the um, 1969 occupation, but it has a bunch of other history in it. So. so they have it set up really, really cool. These, the picture doesn't do it justice, but these hanging photos here are like 20 by 15 feet. So they're actually huge. And to see those photos blown up that big is pretty striking. Um, they did a whole exhibit on these photos and, and talked about the photographer that took them and her relationship to the occupation and everything. Um, I believe that this photographer is non-native, but she spent a lot of time on the island. Um, so some of the most famous photos that you've seen from Alcatraz, they have them displayed like this. Um, and it's awesome because you can read people's names. Um, read like sometimes it'll show it'll tell how long they were on the island or what brought them there um this one i liked a lot this woman is caddo i'll try to read what the bottom says i think it's significant all right this is from the photographer i took this picture on the dock waiting for a boat to alcatraz the first day i went to the island during the 19 months long occupation, Indians came from all over. It was, like on a, it was like on a pilgrimage. Journalists from across the world photographed, filmed, and wrote about the occupation. Decades later, I got a phone call from a woman. She was crying after discovering herself as a little girl in this picture. She is there with her sisters and her mother, sage road traveler Longoria of the Caddo Nation in Oklahoma. That's the woman looking in the picture. The woman looking in the left is the caller's aunt, Diana Vargas. She and her husband, Roberto Vargas, founded the Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco, a now famous institution. The girl with the ponytail is the caller who made the discovery on my website while researching her youth as an urban Native American for a presentation at her daughter's school. So pretty significant stuff in photos there. This is just a close up that I took on because I love this. <laughs> Alcatraz Sioux. Um, I guess you would call these like memorabilia, but that's not really the correct word, but just some of the political pins from the time. You can see my big old reflection in this glass case. <laughs> um, but I just love stuff like this. So everything I thought was awesome. They also have a full teepee set up inside Alcatraz, which is pretty striking. Um, there's kids going in and out of it, but honestly, mo most people were leaving it alone. Um, and back here, they have a video, I think, playing of some of the testimonials from folks that occupied. But yeah, this, this exhibit was kind of in one pretty large building floor. This one's pretty cool too. So here's a note from one of the occupiers. They had a lot of these. I just took a photo of one. It says, I was here at a time when supplies were low. We survived on very little. On many occasions, some of us children, and he was seven, would pilfer food from the storage shed on the dock. And we wouldn't take it and go hide. We would consume the pilfered goods right there. Usually apple jacks without milk and fruit cocktail if we chose our cans wisely. And this is a Seminole Chickasaw um, guy that was a child <laughs> at the time. So we played and tried not to get hurt, he said. Um, I know there was at least one child born on Alcatraz during the occupation, but there were a lot of kids. 
Um, and it lasted for about 19 months. So here's a photo of the famous uh, water tower. Um, it says, peace and freedom, welcome. Home of the free Indian land. Um, another story that I read on one of the note cards um, from an occupier was that, again, from someone who was a child at the time, said that they and their friends were specifically told, do not go up on the water tower. Under no circumstances should you go up there. Um, and of course they did, because they're kids. And they carried up this bucket of red paint and um, knocked it over. And when the bucket was knocked over, one of the kids was basically dangling off the side of the water tower. And so they learned that day why they were told not to go up there. Um, but those they were the ones that um, painted the words here. Again, that's something that's maintained as well. So nice and bright red, easy to read, even in 2022. But down here, you can see some of the gardens. Um, they have a greenhouse even. Um, and everywhere on the island looks like this, like anywhere that something can grow out of, it's growing. So gives it a bright feel, which I felt mixed emotions about because I, I found it to be on the one hand, um, taking in all of the non-visual sensory feelings of the place that I could feel in my body had a lot of trauma. But having it juxtaposed with that beauty, that was weird. <laughs> um, not in a bad way, just hard to put into words, hard to sort through when you're feeling it. Um, but yeah. Um, so I think those are my pictures from the red power. I didn't take pictures of everything, obviously, but um, there's a lot of stuff that is way more interesting than probably what I showed that it's worth going to see for yourself. So um, just some other photos. So <clears throat> they had descriptions of the buildings and everything and, um, you know, everything is just kind of as it is. It's not, I wouldn't say anybody is doing any kind of repainting of anything, any repairs. I think that the maintenance of the, the, the buildings is just to keep them up and running so that, you know, the historical structure is maintained. Um, but, uh, you know, if we think about the millions of dollars that the National Park Service is making from tours of Alcatraz, then to wonder how much of that money goes back into native communities is just a question we don't have answers for. So, um, you know, there's a lot of juxtaposition about it being managed as a national park, um, especially with the occupation basically claiming it as Indian land, uh, as, a, as a sovereign piece of land for that period of time. Um, I have mixed feelings about that, but I understand that it being a national park technically uh, makes it accessible to everyone so that people can learn history. So, you know, whatever. Um, so these are just some more photos of the inside. Nothing really too significant. Just stuff I thought was interesting, like half decrepit toilets. <laughs> just, I don't know, things to me that were aesthetically like intriguing um, to just walk around and wonder what went on there. Um, I've always been that way ever since I was a kid. And I think that's probably why I had a, the reaction that I had to being on Alcatraz is 
I've always like if I'm visiting a place, sometimes places uh, give me feelings that I can't explain. Um, and Alcatraz was like that. So to try to be there and then consider yourself going back in time of what what all has happened there and and to see the the um, evidence of what once was is pretty um eye opening i guess uh this is a room um obviously where prisoners would get their uniforms um and they still have uniforms there shoes and everything and like i said anywhere where something can grow it'll grow <laughs> and i really liked that i liked that um there was vines just coming out of any crack so they, they keep things like this preserved and um, you actually can walk right up to the counter. So I took this picture like from a, a, a grate on that counter where a prisoner would walk up and request their clothes. Um, so yeah, more just view of the island. Lots of areas closed for our safety. <laughs> lots of do not enter <laughs> um there's some spots where i think that it was just a matter of like the safety of um structural integrity and then other spots where it was like hey if you keep going you're gonna be on the side of this island like hanging off of it so probably don't go this way but i liked the um the levels here that you could see because like i said it's um multi-level so um Accessibility wise, something that they said at the beginning was if you have accessibility needs, um, they do have like a golf cart shuttle. So if you're someone who needs assistance in that way, you can still see the whole island and you don't have to walk. Um, even though it is, it, it's a it's a walk um, uphill and there's just like a lot of ground to cover, honestly. So you. You either come prepared to walk or just know that they have a way to get you around the island. More views. I thought these stairs were really cool. Um, again, like all of the vines and, and plant life. So here's the inside of that factory from the beginning. You could see everything that's growing in it. Um, a lot of these buildings are just bones, you know. But I just, I think things like this is really beautiful. So it just, I don't know. It signifies to me like regeneration and growth and healing. All right, so <laughs> I think my next photos are more based around the prison. So um, a little bit of weird background about me as a child is that I don't know why, but I think that I saw the Escape from Alcatraz movie with Clint Eastwood like way too early <laughs> because uh, I just thought that was the most interesting thing ever. I was probably like seven or eight years old watching Clint Eastwood make a paper mache head on the History Channel. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought that was my my first um, encounter with Alcatraz is through that movie as a child. So. I did not learn about the um, indigenous history until I was an adult. So again, I can imagine how many people also did not know that history, but um, a lot of this about the prison side of it fascinates me too. But um, so I was familiar with the, the prison side of things from that movie and then doing a little bit of research, but Alcatraz was basically a prison for folks that they moved over from other prisons. So Alcatraz was like the place they threaten you with. Um, and I actually have a book written by the youngest guard ever to work at Alcatraz. And it's pretty interesting. Um, I cannot imagine working at a federal prison at the age of 20, but you know, um, and being younger than a lot of the prisoners, but interesting view of what life was like uh, being a guard. Um, Apparently, um, Alcatraz was run like on a very strict schedule. So prisoners woke up, ate, did everything at the same time. Um, from what I, I learned, uh, 
the food on Alcatraz was like top quality prison food. Like people wanted the food there. So there are some benefits at Alcatraz as a prisoner. Um, but one thing that they pointed out was that Alcatraz was one of the beginnings of uh, the prison industrial labor complex. So basically Alcatraz was one of those places and we still see it today, but especially back in its earlier days of um, exploiting incarcerated people for labor. So everyone on Alcatraz had a job of some sort. Um, and this is the cell house, if that's not obvious. Um, it looks crowded, but we actually move, you know, you move at your own pace. The cool thing about the cell house is that it is an audio tour. So you get a little device and it helps you move through the cell house in a proper order. And it tells you information about each spot that you're at. Um, yeah, so here's, here's kind of what it looks like when you enter. This is a library. Um, this was kind of interesting because uh, apparently prisoners were not allowed to get their own books. So there was one prisoner whose job was to work at the library. And I think that they were supervised by um, a guard. So prisoners would put in their order and this person would gather the books for them and deliver them to their cells. So prisoners were not allowed actually in the library. Um, but yeah, this the room is kind of, it looks like this. And then if you were to turn around on the si opposite side that's not pictured, it just has big grates like a cell from floor to ceiling. So this is very tall. This is probably like 40 feet high ceiling. So um, this section is the hole. <laughs> um, so the cells were, the cells were all, I wanna say um, five by nine. So very small, very small. <laughs> and those are regular cells. Um, these cells in the hole, they were about the same size, but the, the crazy thing about them is if you could see here, these steel doors, um, and then you can kind of see behind it some, um, you know, cell bars. A person would be thrown in there. The cell bars would be closed and the steel door would be closed to where it was pitch black and they couldn't even see their hand in front of their face. So it's like, yeah, it's the hole, but it's also like a depletion of um, your all of your senses. So a lot of um, you could question the humanity of that but you could question the humanity of a lot of prison practices, but um, yes, you can go inside. <laughs> and yes, I did. Um, of course you can't close the door, but uh, that's the whole, another sink that I thought needed to have its picture taken. There's me at the phone booth. <laughs> so, just a prison phone booth. Um, and I don't have the photo of this, which was probably my mistake, but my friend has the photo of, uh, the cell, the famous cell that the prisoner played by Clint Eastwood escaped out of. Um, the cell is completely preserved. So it's as if it, it is exactly how it was on that day. They never repaired it. They never um did anything to that cell the original paper mache head is on the bed and if this is foreign to anyone um the way that this group of men tried to escape was they um chipped away at a vent in the back of the cell that was almost floor level um with spoons so modified spoons they chipped at the plaster on the wall enough to get the vent face out and it was basically just big enough for like an adult male body to fit through. So a uh, few guys in neighboring cells, they came up with a plan to all go through the vents and to decoy the officers, they made human looking heads out of paper mache. <laughs> One guy was basically able to get paint supplies given to him by the prison under the guise that he was an artist. So they used his paints and they, um, just use like pieces of their own hair to put on the head. And it did um, 
it worked, you know, they did escape. Um, and so all of that is still in that cell. So it, it looks like the guy just left out of there like yesterday, if you go. And the decoy body is in there too. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, I think that my biggest and most uh, maybe in awe moment was the rec yard. And again, pictures don't do it justice at all. But to step out on that wreck yard was like, whoa, it was huge. Um, you can see the whole bay from the top of these stairs. So this is where you enter these stairs and you go downward. Um, what was really striking about it is just, well, one, the weather that day was so nice. Like you can tell that it just looked beautiful out there. But you see the wall is um, about 20 feet tall. So you can only see over the wall if you're sitting up on the steps. So you can imagine being a prisoner there and you can see the bay, but you can't touch the bay. You can see the, the, uh, the bridge in the distance, but you can't see a way out of this island. So um, there were a little, I want to say there was like a small little window on the wall, but Nothing really significant that allowed prisoners any way to see outward. So um, to me, I just thought the rec yard was really striking. And again, I'm just like, man, how many bodies have been out here? Like what has gone on out here? Um, you never know, like what games have been played out here? Like what plans were devised out here? It's just kind of wild. Um, there's me. <laughs> <laughs> just me on the rec yard <laughs> um another view i'm almost done with my pictures clearly i took a lot of the rec yard okay <laughs> um another one of me just being pensive about life apparently i don't know what i was doing there but <laughs> i just thought that that spot was cool um yeah the, the rest of my photos are just like photos of um just details of the island um again you can see kind of how multi-level it is there um but yeah I think that my overall feeling was the longer we were there the more relaxed I felt I felt like I was able to move through the cell house with a lot less uh, feelings of overwhelm than when I we first got there and then when we were um, looking through the Red Power exhibit. Of course, I think that that just elicits a lot of feelings. Um, and we went through the cell house last. So by then I was in a different kind of like headspace, but... Um, my overall takeaway is probably along the lines of like, I felt a lot of emotions there, but on the one hand is like, part of it was very, not necessarily uncomfortable, but feelings like you could feel what has happened. You could feel the bad things. You could feel, you know, just the, the, memory of that of, of the occupation of the Hopi prisoners of everything um of course the lives that were incarcerated here um but at the same time <laughs> what I felt was really odd was this weird feeling of comfort don't know how to explain that really um I'm sorry for being long-winded about it, but it, I felt at ease at the same time. So, especially when we, we finished, um, because the, the good thing about like the way that the tour is set up, like I said, you can go at your own pace and, um, the whole thing, if you're constantly moving around, you're reading stuff, you're going through it at kind of just a casual pace, it, it should take about three hours. It can take longer or shorter. 
and you can get on the ferry pretty much any time to go back. So they have the ferry come to take people back to San Francisco every 15 minutes. So um, when we finished, we just kind of parked our, ourselves on some benches out there near that entry um, with the uh, Indian land sign. And just like <clears throat> sitting there, eating a snack, hoping to not get attacked by birds. <laughs> um, I just felt this, this strange sense of calm. And um, just like, I, I'll say it again, just a visceral feeling that I didn't have control over. Um, that wasn't like a sad feeling necessarily just a heavy, heavy, but also um, with the weather being so nice that day, seeing all the plant life and like, I guess for me, like physically sit, finally being able to set foot on the island, um, there was comfort there. There was some healing. <laughs> of just being in that space, like nothing particularly about what we read or did that day, but just there. Um, and I think that um, that really speaks to like, how we can connect with place. And I know a lot of people have their own um, feelings of connection with like their homelands. Um, I certainly do as well, but I don't know if anyone else can relate, but there's some, there's just some places for me. Like, again, it's just hard to put in, in words on um, why you feel drawn there. And it's not because of, again, any particular thing that happened there. It's just kind of like the general idea of a place like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's how, that's how I left. Uh, I wanna go back. <laughs> um, not sure if, if anyone isn't aware, um, they do gather every Thanksgiving on the island for ceremony. Um, and I think that there are other occasions throughout the year that involve folks who are part of the occupation or their families. Um, so it's still very current, very relevant. Um, yeah, uh, that's, in, in, instead of continuing to repeat myself anymore, I guess I'll end it there, but I'm happy to answer any questions or just hear other people's experiences. So I can stop sharing now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Amelia. It sounds like it was a real emotional, uh, powerful experience just going in the pictures. I'm sure stirred up a lot of memories for Glennis and, and uh, Greg. Um, you know, that probably how what it looked like when they last or when they were there is quite different than what you saw. But just that growth, the growth of the plants for me, you know, is also a reminder of how life does go on and we we do survive and and all. So I thank you. I, well, I, I have can't. one thing that I just remembered since you said plants. Um, one of the rules is don't take anything from the island. <laughs> <laughs> um that being said um like i said there's a lot of succulents <laughs> um, a lot of stuff that had already fallen on the ground that did not have to be pulled and so i put two little pieces of succulent in my pocket <laughs> 
And um, my punishment for doing that was that I tried for almost two months and could not get them to grow here. <laughs> so that's a testament to microclimates and a testament to um, don't break the rules. So <laughs> I had high hopes. I really wanted Alcatraz succulents in my house, but um, clearly Alcatraz succulents did not want to live in, in Texas. Texas. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Thank you again. Uh, I'm sure that after after Greg and Glennis share theirs, that maybe that'll stir you with some other ideas. Who wants to go first, Greg? Are you feeling kind of tired? Would you like to go first? Or Glennis, would you? I'll wait. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say. Sounds like we're going to let you go, Glennis. Oh, okay. So um, I'm Glennis Golden. I am a native of California. I was actually born in Hayward. So the San Francisco Bay and the islands in the bay, because there's a lot of islands there, um, are very familiar to me. Um, you know, my my family heritage is Cherokee out of Oklahoma. Prior to that, North Carolina, you know, we went on the trek. But um, I am um, at the occupation, the, uh, the Indian occupation, you know, Wilma Mankeller was there, um, who was later the um, chief of the Cherokee. Um, I was in my teens. So that tells you a little bit about, about how old I really am. Um, and as far as, um, you know, I am a member and a volunteer with the IIA, but I was one of the founders of what is known as Intertribal Council of at t Employees back in like 85. So, um, you know, long, long years, it's, I, think, I think it's 36 years, um, I was involved in a leader of that organization, um, trying to bring awareness to at t of Native cultures and that we are still here. Um, you know, they never really made it more than about a 1% of employees at at t were Native, um, but, you know, that's what it is. But that's that's a little bit of my point of reference. So probably the, the biggest thing I want to share after looking at and hearing about Amelia's um, experiences um, back in the 70s, the early 70s, you know, 70, 71, um, much different place. Um, you look at the water, it is not calm. You know, they showed the one photo of um, Indians in a canoe um, I don't know how in the world they would have made it and traversed the waters there, because although they may look a little calm, they're very, very rough um, and freezing cold. So, you know, the, the climate there draws water, the top of the water flows out into the ocean, but the undercurrents bring in all the freezing water. So, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. There's also more than a dozen um, types of sharks. Tiger shark was a big one that was around um, there. So when you look at what it took to actually get on the island or the occupiers, um, that you couldn't just take a ferry. You couldn't take a boat because there were, there were military and there were police and people stopping you from getting anywhere near the island. So to get onto the island, either you had to have somebody who had a boat and they were willing to take it to the island. My family, we had a little 15 foot boat. My nephew, or my, my brother, my father and my uncle, we attempted to go out there. We actually went on the guise of fishing. But I'll tell you, the waters are really rough and we were in a little 15 foot boat. It was, it was difficult. You couldn't really even get close to the, the, uh, the island because it is rocks. And what you don't see is it's boulders and rocks. So as the waves come in, you're crashing against all those rocks. So when you think about people going there, um, they actually had to get in the water. They couldn't pull up at the dock where they brought prisoners in. They actually had to dive into the water with the sharks and everything else to get to that land. So um, the other part is um, if you didn't bring it with you, you didn't have it. So when you talked about the store and, you know, they're getting cereal, somebody had to package that up, get it waterproofed and get it carried to the land because there was nothing. 
there was nothing and there was no boats. So, you know, you, they, they relied on people trying to bring things and to actually float them um, to get them to the island so people would have supplies. So the few children that made it where that's what they went through. We made it to touch a couple rocks, but we actually didn't make it physically on the land. Um, from there, we actually went over to Angel Island, which is a little further away, but most of the, the islands in the bay were some type of prison or internment. So Angel Island was the place where they put a lot of the Asian people during the World Wars. So a lot of people don't realize that, yes, those islands were used as prisons, not just, you know, the federal pen, but they, they were internment camps. So, you know, it's interesting hearing Amelia because after being there and sitting in the bottom of this 15 foot little boat in all the rough waters and having the, the, the being chased, you know, by boats trying to get you away from the island, it's just very interesting and different to hear, you know, that, that you can actually walk on it and get there. So, you know, things like the red power of movement. The other thing about that is a lot of the people that were occupying it, there were p other people had some underlying um, reasons for being there. So that's why you sort of hear about they left, you know, in the 71, in like 71, they left because the movement was starting to change and it was no longer really truly about um, the natives trying to take possession of a land that the federal government threw away because that was the only way the tribes were getting land is if it was something the federal government didn't want, they had a chance. So that's, that's a little bit of what, you know, I really know, but I'll tell you when I saw your pictures the first time, I started crying myself because I can remember being in that boat and just being able to touch a little bit of the, the, the land and having my father yell at me, don't put my hand in the water because there were sand sharks and stuff like, and don't step out there. So, you know, it, it brings a lot back. Like I said, you know, I was 14, 15 years old at the time that island was occupied. So that's just a little bit of my perspective of it. So. So I guess that's, Thank I'll, you I'll so just much. leave it there. But. Yeah, but they pitch uh, talks uh, after Greg talks, let's kind of get some discussion on that because that's that's really emotional. I was trying to picture being that young and being in a boat and trying to be successful and trying to be present at this, you know, historical gathering and then not being able to get there and how scary that was. It sounds like it was really um, very strange very stressful and I can't imagine the first talk the first people who got there but I bet Greg has some stories <laughs> or has heard stories <laughs> so Greg go for it <laughs> well I I wound up in Southern California under the relocation program in 62 and uh, I now have family all over California as a consequence, but 69, I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps and come back from Vietnam and uh, had started college. So <clears throat> when all of this was taking place over there, even though I ha had have family, um, had been to San Francisco, um, but I had never been out there, never even thought of, of it um, as an Apache. There are things that we're not supposed to do, and some of us do them anyway. And uh, I met a Oglala Lakota woman from Pine Ridge. And uh, at NIEA 7778, I moved to San Francisco. Um, I thought I had found the woman and the dream. 
So during the two years that I was there, 78, 70 to 80, when I moved back to Dallas, uh, I did a lot of things. Um, part of what I did was contract um, employment with the administration Native Americans, which originally was called ONAP, Office of Native American Programs. When Reagan came in, the term Native American became the law of the land and the term Hispanic became the law of the land. So part of what I did was do training for the urban Indian centers in the Bay Area uh, from Hoopa to um, San Jose. So I had occasion to be around some of the people that actually were the ones that went into the island that took over. I heard a lot of their stories, was able to ask some questions to wonder. And I did make a trip with some of them from the Urban Indian Center in San Francisco, um, who had been there, uh, who had occupied, who had, as you were talking, Glenn is explaining the reality of what it took uh, to get there and what was there and not there and there wasn't a whole lot there like you said anything that you needed or wanted or had to have you either took it with you or didn't get it the thing that i remember the most was listening to their stories the anger and the pride of what they had achieved and accomplished um, growing up the way I did in a traditional way I made sure that I had plenty of tobacco um, had some sage and some cedar and we did ceremony. Uh, I have told most of the IIA group over the years about the use of tobacco for ceremonial purposes. Uh, you talked about that national organization that you helped put together and um, being a Fed, a retired Fed, I was able to go to a lot of the regional offices, the 10 regional offices with the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare, now the US Department of Health and Human Services. I always took tobacco because my dad's dad would say, take medicine to protect yourself, take medicine to thank great spirit, walk along and just drop it. As you were walking along, no matter where you're at, because non-Indian people have no idea what you're doing and why and how powerful and sacred it is for us to protect ourselves and the environment. Amelia, I said what I did to you and thank you first of all for sharing 
this part of your life with us and with me. Uh, as your uncle, it means a lot to me to listen to your words, to your thoughts, to your energy. And I really, really like to hear you say several times about the calmness. You know, we all walk our own walk, talk our own talk. But the sacredness of what great spirit has for us that allows us to go anywhere, certainly in the Americas, and have that feeling of comfort is because we're home. And all of you, or most of you have heard me say and will hear me say, you know, I have never been a stranger anywhere North Pole to South Pole. As a native person, I am home. And to me, when I heard you say that it was a calming, that you felt good, that you felt comfortable, you know, the place is far enough along now. And there are people who were there and did a lot of ceremony and still go back and do ceremony. I don't have to go back to do ceremony with and for our people in Alcatraz or anywhere else, North Pole to South Pole. So I, I had uh, the honor and privilege, like I said, of being there 78 to 80. I did one trip out to the rock. What impressed me the most uh, that I have carried since in is the courage of our people like you, Glennis, who made a commitment and followed it. Um, I want to deviate just a little bit and leave it at this. When I was talking with Kathy and my family, especially Saliti, about what we were going to do with your pictures, stories, um, it's the American Indian movement. I have never been part of the American Indian movement, have never joined them but I have supported them organizationally on certain things over the years. And my understanding is that there was a mix of some of the people that went back to Alcatraz that reclaimed what is, not was, but for me is and forever will be ours. Whether the systems, people, the government, the foreigners, etc., recognize it or not, we in our spirit know that Mother Earth, North Pole to South Pole, is ours. And we are able to walk with each other and perform ceremony with each other and keep growing in a good way. So the other thing that was go going on in the Bay Area when I was there the two years was DQU, 
And basically that's where Dennis and Russell would come in every now and then and uh, um, Crow Dog and other members of AIM and do sweats and do ceremonies. And I went up and participated in some of that. So I want to thank each and every one of you who is part of our dream under the guise of the Indigenous Institute of the Americas. Because for us, when we started putting this dream together, this is what it's about. Our past, our present, and our future. So I want to thank each and every one of you for all that you have done and continue to do until the seventh generation. Thank you. That's and, all. <clears throat> thank you so much. You know, one of the things that we uh, didn't talk about is what led to the occupation. And I've heard, you know, some uh, stories about that, but I was wondering if Greg, if you or Glennis would mind sharing what you remember or what you've learned that's not necessarily in the history books, but was a part of that, um, that story. Well, I'll let my Cherokee niece talk about that. And then I will maybe add something. Um, so I wish that I could be more thorough on this, but uh, to my knowledge, um, again, Glennis can probably correct everything I'm about to say. <laughs> um, to my knowledge, uh, around that point in time, um, there was a lot of political uprising going on. Um, and they, I believe that the, that the decision to occupy Alcatraz was, um, of course, um, and, and this is also what I read uh, from the information that they had on the island was, a lot of it was about making a statement. So um, they made the decision to finally participate in the occupation, I, I think after the San Francisco Indian Center burnt down um, and yeah. there was no space um, yeah. designated. No space. rebuild. Yeah, yeah. So um, that like was the final spur that sent people to do the occupation. But, um, you know, they made the document about demands from the Indians of all tribes. I can pull that yeah. up too. I think that's really relevant. It's still relevant today. Um, so they, I mean, they utilize the island as a, a, a way to reclaim um, Indian land, make a, a political statement and also get it to have more publicity on the national scale. Um, and so like Glennis was saying, they occupied for around 19 months. Um, and again, to my knowledge, some of it had to do with uh, supplies issues running out. And then also, of course, like the federal government starting to physically remove people from the island. Um, that's my understanding of it. And, and that is accurate, Amelia. That is completely accurate. So the, the climate, the social climate, um, was um, no tribe was really treated well um, in that part of California. So, um, you know, my, my family, we had a lot of artifacts and we actually loaned them for display at a couple museums and stuff and things like, and other families did as well. And they refused to return them to us because they said they were too valuable to, to give us the items back. So that was, you know, that is for those who do have family artifacts, you know, hundred plus 
couple of hundred years old to have them taken away because they said you you're not worthy of your family is you know a lot of that was some of the underlying um issues that were taking place that the you know the you weren't recognized as as viable I mean, I hate to say it that way, but you were not re recognized as a viable person in the community. You were considered as cast down. So um, that that's a lot of things that happened. And like I said, when they, they were going out there, they actually, to get onto the island, they had to swim. So it's about a mile and a half. They, they got closer, but it's about a mile and a half distance wise from land out to Alcatraz. But swimming, that's like about a two and a half mile swim in freezing cold waters with sharks and stuff. So it's, it was, it was one of those, this is us, we must do this. This is our land. They don't want it. We need to start making sure they know we are still here. So, um, you know, the climate, the social climate at the time that brought, hopefully that gives a little better perspective. Um, but I, I know being born and raised in that area, you know, and especially if being native, you weren't thought of very highly, but being mixed race native, it was even, it was just as bad. So, um, you know, hearing about your visit is, I, it makes me feel good that you not really having all of that background went there and felt comfortable and you could see and you could feel. Um, that's really nice to hear because it, 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 was, it was tumultuous. The times were tumultuous, so. so um, was, oh, oh, go ahead. I was looking at, um, I was probably 12, I think at the time uh, when this was going on. So I think my awareness was, um, we, we talked about it in school, though. I mean, it was a part of our history classes. I've mentioned before that when I was in Oklahoma at the time I grew up, the education was really excellent. So, you know, we covered all of these major things, but somebody was recently sharing with me the part that I didn't catch on. And that was, where did the idea come to go to Alcatraz? And so there was some sort of a federal law, is that correct? That if the federal government no longer is utilizing land mm -hmm. and so somebody had to have at the indian center had to have you know had one of those nights where by sitting around talking and saying hey dang let's just go <laughs> take over alcatraz like i would have loved to have been in on that conversation <laughs> you know to hear it um the um the proclamation that they made is really relevant i pulled it up um and I, I just love it if anyone on the call is not familiar with it. The way that they wrote it was very like sticking it to the man. Um, do you want me to, I can read it really quick. I would like you to, I think that's a good idea. I would too, that'd be a great way to kind of close things. Because it kind of talks about some of the stuff you all are discussing. Um, so it's titled the proclamation to the great white father and all his people. We, the Native Americans, reclaim the land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. We wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with the Caucasian inhabitants of this land and hereby offer the following treaty. We will purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24 in glass beads, red cloth, a precedent set by the white man's purchase of a similar island about 300 years ago. We know that $24 in trade goods for these 16 acres is more than what was paid when Manhattan Island was sold, but we know that land values have risen over the years. Our offer of $1.24 per acre is greater than the 47 cents per acre that the white men are now paying the California Indians for their land. We will give to the inhabitants of this island a portion of that land for their own, to be held in trust by the American Indian Affairs and by the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs to hold in perpetuity for as long as the sun shall rise and the rivers go down to the sea. We will further guide the inhabitants in the proper way of living. We will offer them our religion, our education, our life ways in order to help them achieve our level of civilization and thus raise them and all their white brothers up from their savage and unhappy state. 
We offer this treaty in good faith and wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with all white men. We feel that this so-called Alcatraz Island is more than suitable for an Indian reservation as determined by the white man's own standards. By this, we mean that this place resembles most Indian reservations in that one is isolated from modern facilities and without adequate means of transportation. Two, it has no fresh running water. Three, it has inadequate sanif sanitation facilities. Four, there are no oil or mineral rights. Five, there is no industry and so unemployment is very great. Six, there are no healthcare facilities. Seven, the soil is rocky and non-productive and the land does not support game. Eight, there are no educational facilities. Nine, the population has always exceeded the land base. 10, the population has always been held as prisoners and kept dependent on others. Further, it would be fitting and symbolic that ships from all over the world entering the Golden Gate would first see Indian land and thus be reminded of the true history of this nation. This tiny island would be a symbol of the great lands once ruled and by free and noble Indians. So that's a proclamation. There's a separate, um, there's a letter um, and other you know, documents that talk about the demands and the plans that they had. So I, if I'm not mistaken, they wanted to, or I guess the, the bigger goal for Alcatraz if it had seen past 19 months was to turn it into sovereign land. So they wanted to have an Indian center, a sovereign school, uh, you know, a self-run government, health center, all of that stuff on the island was what I've read in the past. Um, and that's what was being done. And that's why the federal government again stepped in and did what they did. And that's why they are using us again to bring in money. And the question you asked about, are we getting any of it, you know? Are any of our Indian tribes, especially California tribes, or say the Urban Indian Center in San Francisco, are they getting any? No. I am going to ask us as a group, and you, <clears throat> Amelia, and you, Annette, particularly, uh, who has basically keeps us going electronically. Um, if you who are part of this and have been listening or are familiar with what we're talking about would feel comfortable in having that proclamation posted mm -hmm. as part of the IIA Zoom that we're having right now. Yeah, because we could post this, we could do this one in particular on the website and have the proclamation um, you know, like put next to the video and also uh, put it in the YouTube channel with the link so that people could go and look at the uh, information that way with more detail. I love that idea. Very cool. I'm going to add this. You know, this is uh, for me, to me, uh, my family, and I'm not talking about my immediate nuclear family. I'm talking about uh, DNA and Indian way family. Just one of the many things that we have overcome and continue to overcome. Um, my late sister, Pam, Sickle Mitchell from Akwesasne. When she retired from Indian Ed here in the US, up in New York, she moved to Canada because her mom, Mama Rose, uh, was Algonquin. Her dad had passed 
uh, he was one of the last spiritual leaders of the Mohawk people at Akwesasne and St. Regis. And um, one of our advisors, Carla Button, who's uh, Seneca, there are many things that have happened with our people. And I'm using those two as an example of things that, as I said about AIM, not a member of, but supporting. Uh, so this may be some of the other things that we want to discuss in the future as part of our Zoom. I would love to get Carla <clears throat> to talk about, you know, some of their history and not too distant history in dealing with the white people around the, the money fact that the propane butane people tapped into their gift from creator, took it over and said, well, tell you what, we will provide propane free of charge. Whoop-de-doo. <laughs> but that's all they, that's all they were getting. And I haven't talked with Carla recently about this, but I wonder sometimes if they are still getting free gas when it belongs to them. And that's why I say, and I'm gonna say this, last week when the physical therapist came in, something came up and I made the statement not comment, but a statement. I said, you know, I refuse to buy land because it's my land. And why should I pay foreign people for, for what belongs to me and my people? And yeah, I, I own land now, quote, unquote. Nobody owns land, belongs to creator. But I think this kind of topics for educational purposes, for sharing in a non-aggressive, in a non-volatile manner are very important. At least that's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're running over time. It's been a really very wonderful, a real different view of things, you know. So um, I will get this posted on our um, website and on our YouTube channel at II Americas. And we will get the links to those. Maybe Amelia, you could help me get the links to the uh, proclamation and declarations that were made uh, because they are, they're very pertinent to today. And for those of us that um, have lived through those many, uh, the many generations of change, <laughs> do you want to call it that change that has remained the same? <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of nice. It's nice to see these young people revisiting these stories and, and bringing them to life again, because sometimes um, these stories get buried amongst all the other new stories that have come. So I appreciate it, Amelia. And Glennis, what a wonderful family story too, um, of trying to get to that island and 
but still making it to an island. <laughs> You know? <laughs> it, it and and you know I don't know that I would ever go there, but I just remember I will never forget that one attempt in that small boat in the really rough water, and it it had a windshield on it, and we fell through the windshield and broke that trying to get onto the island. Oh. So I mean that, that's memories I have, but it's so nice to hear that you know hear Amelia's perspective. It's just. Um, that at least you can get on a ferry boat now and <laughs> relax as you go. Yeah, I mean, the feelings are still there. That's, yes, that's, yes. that's yes. what I took away is still there. Glennis, I'm going to ask you if you would consider sharing with us the Cherokee longest walk from Oklahoma to California because that is part of our, that is part of our history you know most people even today don't realize that Gene Autry was part of that movement that he achieved and accomplished a lot but there were many other Cherokee people, the Zalagi people like yourself, whose families moved right. west, and a lot of them stayed throughout areas of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and certainly California. And I, over the years, being the curious kid that I are, I have been fascinated by that part of US history, Indian history, and the fact that there are more Cherokee people in California than anywhere else. So I'm asking for you to think about it and see if it's something that you would be willing at some point in time in the future to do a Zoom meeting of that. And, and I didn't, I wasn't alive, of course, <laughs> but my family, my family traversed that. So um, I, I will definitely think about that and make sure I reach back out. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, presenters. Okay. <laughs>